We are alive. I haven't figured out if we're on that mic or not. I think we're on my mic. If you're going to get a coke, now's the time. What? Sorry. See, it's picking you up, and I can't tell whether... Well, it's picking me up better. It's mine. That's not So, I'm not sure how you figured out how to switch why it's not switching. I think it, no, it's picking me up. Go on to the camera. What part of stand up and start talking? There's no when involved, it's now. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we're alive. Okay. I, I'm Dave Jaffe, and uh, last month we didn't have a SQP meeting because it gives people an opportunity to go to the uh, maker fair. So I took some pictures, and I grabbed other pictures from the internet. And uh, so we'll go through a little uh, photo album. So I got there early and they uh, got us through the uh, gate and uh, into a uh, fencing area where we saw uh, this guy. Uh, and you can see that we saw when um, this is a gas operated octopus, mechanical gas operated octopus, gas mobile. Or no, no, uh, 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 LNG? Yeah. Honestly? Yeah, not the gas. So, and it's mobile, it's on this thing here, and uh, it's a big attract. Um, it's really interesting, these arms go up and down, there's these pilot flames that are always lit, and then they'll uh, shoot some um, natural gas through here, and they'll light up, and uh, if you're like 20 feet away, it's really a field of heat. Especially when all of them go off like this. And so, you know, I'm back here. I'm in the front row over here someplace. And so that was really neat. So that was it. And it's even better at night. Yeah. Then, uh, so this is the mobile part of the device. Yeah, this is another um, another mobile mobile dragon, right? So we're still waiting in line, you know, to, 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 to drop the uh, barrier and get inside. And there's the usual wackiness that you've seen it all, all the uh, I think somebody else took this picture. But there's, you know, this guy with this cardboard, I think it was a cardboard costume walking around, you know, that sort of neat. And there's uh, this other one uh, made out, obviously made out of cardboard box. I think he's on stilts or something there. So that's pretty neat. Yeah. And uh, I saw this thing. I wasn't quite sure. Now no, I'm not quite sure what it was. But the guy was wearing it, and I think there's a grass on the other side here. Um, so that one picture is right there. Or maybe this, maybe these are fingers or something. I don't know. So I'm not sure if this is the same one or another one, but this is just a a grasp for that so <coughs> that this guy can control my my own replicas. So there's the electrodes that pick up uh, 
uh, surface signals from the muscles and that activates the, the gripper. So um, that was pretty interesting. And your standard assortment of uh, homemade robots. The place is very crowded, you know, it's always out on, on the Sunday. They have these little uh, um, workshops, they're like half hour workshops, uh, both inside and outside. Um, there's a few of those. Of course, we'll keep this up here without cupcakes. So, uh, yeah, that's obviously fun. And of course, uh, I like the chocolate ones better. Um, and you see the giraffe before. Um, it actually uh, picks up its legs and walks. And these tires are actually made for friction and they don't roll. So they're sort of pinned in that, that position, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, this is all going to be a uh, conference. They have this big indoor area, one whole uh, uh, building set aside for buying things and uh, you know there's books and kits and kids to do and soldering stuff and computers <laughs> and work other merchandising and stuff. Just phenomenon. Is the solder ready for you? Uh couldn't I didn't know. And even if it's a make it you've got to have the mouse trap game there. They're, they're always there. And I think this is one from a previous year because I don't think this house was there this year. But the uh, house track game was there. And I think that this one was from last year or the year before as well. I think that we thought it was there this year. You know, just mobile things going on. You know, I've been to a mall, so. Yeah, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Adam Savage gave a talk. From this uh, up to uh, last year, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so I've been in the mall, so it's not surprising anymore. This stuff. And a couple cars. This one this is a pinnacle. This one looks a little bit more pinnacle with bicycle tires. Sort of fun. This is a uh, sculpture that uh, sort of articulates beams in the wind. That was pretty neat. And you've got these other uh, uh, cups in the background. The uh, I've got the, these two pictures from the internet. There was this talk by this guy who makes these uh, little things that fly. And uh, so it's, it, you know, these are really, you know, there, there was a, um, you could buy these for a kit that made these from the uh, 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 toy game, where you'd uh, uh, cut off part of it and it had to be a certain length, and it sort of acted like a uh, narrow dynamic and you were able to throw it. And it, it seems like you sort of recreated that with this device. And this is just a whole other one. But I wasn't at this talk, so I can't say much about it, but it seems like an interesting picture. And, uh, uh, I didn't see this either, so this is like a, uh, a glass of steam or vapor, I think. And there's one whole building that was all dark on the side. They have all bunch of things that, you know, that lit up. Things that you can run through. Uh, giant bubbles. Oh, now we're indoors again. Uh, this is a thing from two slides ago. It's really sort of odd when you walk through a dark building like this with lots of people running around and kids and stuff. But that's probably the best way to display some of this stuff. A lot of uh, sculpture type things going on. This was pretty neat, it was hanging from the ceiling. And I think it's made up of probably the itself looks rather than being lit from the outside. And of course, you've got to have a pleasant point of position. So now we have to put people inside, inside the cages. Although I didn't hear the uh, pleasure of our band this year. It was hard-tired stuff. 
goes up to our stuff. Yeah, no, these are animated. See, these are these are pneumatic uh, actuators. So I think they even work for that. Uh, I'll keep the like, choreograph. That's why I remember this now. And, and the whole, um, all the instrumentation is in the truck. In the truck. That can make these things. This one is pretty, pretty neat. This is like a, a one wheel motorized unicycle slash skateboard motorized. Uh, Seems to work pretty well. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about So you can you really want to go out. So here's uh, Sam Savage. He's on top of the, uh, the mouse platform. Um, Talking. And one thing that you notice in your, in your structures, there's no cross pricing up here. So it made the whole, this whole platform rather tricky. Um, that's what we talked about. And there was a bunch of drones flying around too, especially for this talk, um, which uh, I'll show you right now. It's supposed to be 10 minutes, but it's a very good talk. Now you can't press the button. There's the button. <laughs> Comic-Con in size and scope. Yeah, man, I've been to every one of these since its inception, and it gets bigger every year and more awesome every year. So that's the drone flying around. Look, most years I've come with, a, with somewhat of a prepared talk and then kind of winged it. This year I was thinking, what could I talk about? And I thought, well, what about lists? Humans have loved lists since Moses. So I thought... Maybe Ten Commandments of Making. I wanted to talk about Ten Commandments of Making. And so I wrote them down. I came up with nine, unfortunately. The things never quite turn out the way that you planned. But in the end, on my way down, I came up with the ten. So finally, I have a list of ten solid things that I would have loved someone to tell me when I first started burning and cutting myself in order to have the things that I needed to have. The first rule of making, I will say, is make something, anything, cook, weld, carve, sculpt, anything that you need to make. It's important that you make it. Humans do two things that make us unique from all other animals. We use tools and we tell stories. And when you make something, you're doing both at once. 
You're telling a story about your desire. You're telling a story about something that you want. You're telling a story about something that you see needs to be made. And you are using your tools to improve yourself and improve the world around you. When you make new things, you are joining in the most ancient dialogue that humans have ever had. So, commandment the first, make something, make anything. It may feel like it's totally insignificant, but it's vital that you do it. Number two, make something occasionally that actually improves your life. From a toilet paper holder that actually works to a, a, a toaster that's, a, that's slightly improved. When you make something that you use every day as opposed to something that's useless, I can't even tell you how good it feels. Even like a handle on a drawer. You make a handle on a drawer and you're using it every single day. The patina of your use that it gets feels really good. Again, and it's another story. Okay, here's one. There's a million different skills being displayed out here. And I'm sure a lot of you are walking around and thinking, I wish I could do that. I wish I had that skill. Several of these commandments have to do with skills. The thing is, is that a lot of times we stop ourselves from moving forward with a project because we don't know how to weld or we don't know carpentry. And my advice is, start now. Start right now to do the thing that you want to do. There is no time like right now. And do it with the things in front of you. If you want to weld a car frame but you don't have a welder or a car or a frame, go ahead and mock it up out of oak tag and cardboard. There's a beautiful sculptor here in the Bay Area who made himself a 747 out of manila file folders. It's one of the loveliest things I've ever seen. Four. Four? Four, yes. I can't learn any skills unless I have a project to learn with. I need a goal. I need something. Well, it's like I need to need something. I need the thing that I'm trying to attain. I can't learn to weld just by someone showing me that it should sound like frying eggs if you set the dials like this. I need to end up with wolverine claws or a sword or a pair of stilts or something like that. Always try to find a project that will get you interested in the thing that you want to build. Almost halfway there. Five. Ask. Ask questions. Ask for help. Ask for advice. Ask for feedback. You'll find when you make stuff that it actually kind of makes you vulnerable to ask for feedback because it totally does. But if you find someone you trust, ask for advice. And when you find someone you trust, ask for feedback. I'll tell you, it's very funny. Among adults, we rarely actually turn to each other and say, what do you think of the work that I'm doing? And it's because that places us in a very vulnerable spot. But again, if you can find a teacher or a mentor or someone whose opinion you really respect, asking them very specifically about how they think you're doing can give you incredible insight. I've done it a few times in my life, and every single time I've gotten a tremendous perspective on what I was actually doing. Share. Now there's a lot of talk about the sharing economy. I'm sure Etsy is totally present here at Maker Faire. And we trade stuff and we trade knowledge. That is really, really important. There is nothing that makes me angrier when somebody does something beautiful and you ask how it's done and they say it's a secret. No secrets. What are you protecting? Nobody's going to take your technique and then steal your right. Nobody has a monopoly on being you. And if you think that your technique is what makes you interesting, you're being ridiculous. So share your techniques. Because when you do, someone's going to come back to you with a better way of doing it. You're going to learn something from that. Seven, please recognize that discouragement and failure are part of every single make project. Not something that happens every now and then. In every single project, you will find yourself discouraged and you will fail at some point. If you recognize that, boy, these balcony railings are terrifying. If you recognize that you're going to fail, at least when it's about to happen, when you are getting discouraged because you hit a snag and you don't have a part and it's Sunday night and it's 4 a.m., at least then you know that that's part of what's going to happen and that the next morning it may be a little harder to get started, but if you know that mechanism, you can actually keep going. I personally, and I've said this many times before, 
Whenever I'm making something, about 70% of the way in, I actually think I have no idea what I'm doing and I hate what I'm building. And Fellini even said that he knows that one of his films is almost finished when he totally despises it. And frankly, that 70, 80, 90% mark, the closer you get to the end, the more scared I get. Because it turns out that I hate finishing things. I'd much rather keep working on them and keep getting that endorphin rush of the eBay research and finding that part that I didn't know existed. Actually getting all the way to the end is a little bit difficult. But if you recognize what your mechanism is, where are the places you'll get frustrated, they are your friends. You can welcome them in. This is also part of mindfulness and meditation. Understand that those thoughts are going to happen and embrace them. Look, they still are going to suck. I'm not going to lie to you. It sucks to fail. It hurts to cut yourself. But it's going to happen in every single project. Eight, measure carefully. <laughs> Measure carefully. So, for the younger builders of the audience, when you have two things that fit tightly together, that's called a close tolerance. When you have two things that fit loosely together, that is a loose tolerance. Knowing the prioritization, knowing when to use a tight tolerance and a loose tolerance is pretty much everything that separates the expert from the novice. I have messed up so many projects, even Three days ago, I screwed up a project because I tried to work with tolerances that were too tight. It's just, you have to know where you can be tight and where you can be loose. Measuring carefully is the way you do that. Number nine, make things for other people. I can't even describe to you how much pleasure I get when I make something and then I give it to somebody else and they get a story, they get the thing that I've made, they get... The, the fruit of a couple of hours of my time and concentration, and they get to possess it. There, it does make you vulnerable when you give your stuff away. You should recognize that. Giving your stuff away does actually place you in a slightly vulnerable position, but it is also a really magical one. So occasionally, when you're making stuff, give it away. Give it to other people. Number 10. Now, if I could go back in time, in a time machine, and tell my young self one thing, one thing about making that I really wish I'd known at the beginning, it would save a lot of money, time, and hurt bent fingers. The last commandment, use more cooling fluid. Yes, cold metal cuts much better than hot metal. Those, those are my ten commandments of making food. I, I love Maker Fair. I'll see you guys next year. Lots of people there, obviously. Oh, I went out Sunday, and it was jammed. It seemed to be less. I don't know if that's true, but it seemed to be less. I don't know. I, I just felt it was a bit fun saying. Well, the first year that I went to the same thing was the way it was mapped I got the first
addressing problems that want um, use a lot of these techniques like class and something works in for developing software as well. I mean knowing that um, um, knowing that uh, uh, you know what you what you're gonna do is uh, gonna be a prototype and knowing that the first thing you do is it's gonna fail, maybe the second thing you do is gonna find and fail, but it's important to know that you know with failure you learn something. Hopefully you learn something that you can use for the next prototype. So it's really really important. And uh, um, uh, sharing is important and using the resources, um, doing things for other people, obviously, um, it's doing things that can assist with technology for the person with a disability that can you know, take care of my time. And, you know, I really like to uh, just talk about using the right set of tolerances because I've seen a lot of students fail because um, they try to do things very precisely. Just can't keep that up. That's right. I'm doing the public thing. So I really like that. that advice. I've never heard of it before. But then it's just made a good thing. Have you ever heard of that advice? No, no. I've heard that, but I haven't that's heard about it. That's a good thing. What do you think that's about? Yes. Well, no. I, I think what he says is a little bit different. That yeah, now, it is. You shouldn't use close tolerances. You know, when you have doesn't make any sense. You're going to be, you should use close tolerance when you're necessary. Yeah. And maybe your code effect should be these tolerances by design to get past the point where you're being stopped by a uh, high tolerance issue. It's like a setting. So there's a, um, another little. Uh, after he gave that talk, he was like about 30 minutes of questions and answers about you know, what's the most dangerous thing you've done, you know, what's, you know what, what, what uh, you do, you do, you do you, yeah, you know, what you do that, and there's that place, you know, right you the most. Um, he did this little talk afterward, but after coming down, so it's going to be some I'm not sure there was anything overwhelming that I, I saw after that lecture. There was a lot of stuff of previous years. The one thing that I like um, is that something that is very high density RGB display made out of LEDs, multi-color LEDs, controlled by an Arduino, like $100, $100 or something like that. It's really nice. Maybe I should have bought it. All the rest of the stuff. Right here. Cool. Um, so, Adam, you've uh, you've been at Maker Fair since the start. How have you seen it change over the years? Um, mostly, what I've seen change in Maker Fair over the years is that one is the volume is hard oh, to you bet. hard to ignore. The number of people now is many many times what it was when it started. But also, the the questions I get from even the youngest attendees here at Maker Faire are really, really awesome. Uh, especially, you know, I'm about to do an autograph signing. And the questions that I get at that are fantastic. It's not just like, what's your favorite, what's the biggest, what's the stinkiest, stuff like that. It's, it's really deep questions about like, what did you wish you'd known about steel or wood, you know, specific making questions, or even taking us to task for stuff we did wrong. I love that kind of dialogue. I love that, you know, the maker culture makes a kid bold enough to want to really ask that kind of stuff and investigate. Great, isn't it? Yeah. So a lot of people look up to you. What type of things have you seen that inspire you? Um, you know, it, it's, it's constant. Um, the, one of the great things that's happening right now is electronics hacking getting super advanced at the same time as the floor is getting lower and lower and lower. So it's easier and easier and easier. 
So the people are just starting to hack and build and create some of the most awesome things that automated systems for their house or robots or uh, you know uh, uh, creations that they can add sound and lights to and stuff like that. So I love checking out that sort of home built aesthetic of the of people using electronics in a way that never would have seemed possible when I was a kid. It's crazy. So do you have any favorite electronics prototyping boards, stuff that you play with? Um, I'm currently playing around now with, uh, with some Arduino stuff for a couple of my projects and Raspberry Pi. And then there's another uh, little soundboard we were playing with, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, uh, because it's, I've never even considered putting sound into a lot of my props, because up until now it was prohibitive. You know, it's going to cost me hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get it to work, and now it's like thirty dollars. Yeah, it's it's really wild. The uh, favorite uh, big projects, exhibits that you've seen over the years. What what are a couple that stand out to you? I, I tell you, I I freaked out about the Lego Pavilion. I mean, Legos were just the Legos were my start. That's exactly how I started thinking in three dimensional space. Uh, and watching the creations that people make here are phenomenal. I also love the really big Burning Man projects, like the, this car, the octopus, these guys, you know, there's there's that drive to make something that gets you out of the space that you're in, that inspires these guys to do something impossible in the most inhospitable place in the world. And I love the creations that come out of that kind of challenge. Do you ever see something here and you go, oh man, I wish I thought of that first? Not I wish I thought of it first, but boy, I wish I, I, wish I could do that. You know, I want to add that to the list of things I got to do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just it's constant and unending here. I see everything I see. Oh, you're know, cool. Jet powered unicycles, awesome. You know, I just like, all of it inspires me. What's not enough time. <laughs> That's the biggest challenge. I think if we could solve that problem, that 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 would be the, be the best make creation in the world. Well, you know, it's, I'm lucky enough to invest in my shop to make way to invest in a set of tools that allow me to work really fast. And that's one of the biggest things is that you know I try and be really smart with my time so that I can maximize it. It's tricky. What are some of the fast tools, things that people could go and look at? I have a giant sander, a 16-inch sander, and you could literally feed a two by four into it. And there's just like no wasting time with those little sanders with the belts constantly getting clogged. This is just a giant behemoth. So what? Uh, what's what's the the, the biggest project or the, the the epiphany project that you? haven't yet made? What's the one that's on your mind that someday you will get to? I, you know, I've, I've always wanted to make myself a suit of armor. And I've been building a set of metalworking tools of uh, shop bags and uh, phenolic hammers and planet hammers and English wheels and stuff like that, all with the goal of eventually blacksmithing myself a full suit of armor. Hello. And I don't know when I'll get around to doing it, but that's absolutely the top of the list. If you get a chance, check out the guy inside who's got the battle armor for cats and mice. Oh, that, oh, I've seen his stuff. I've seen his stuff online. It's absolutely gorgeous. Great. Well, thanks for being here every year. Uh, it's everybody, you're a hero, and, uh, and it's great to be inspired and uh, keep things uh, exciting for everybody. I, I really appreciate it. I, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful position that Maker Fair allows me to come in and talk every year. I love talking to this crowd. It's just so much fun. I love you. Thanks, Adam.
pretty commercial. If you're selling, you pay a fee for the space. I, I don't know the arrangements. There's a lot more uh, wage fees, <coughs> laser, heavy machine. All big boys. Yeah, they, they, have they, have they, they have big booths. And I haven't heard any feed, any backlash to that yet. So, and, and I think Adam even mentioned it, that it's become more commercial. I don't know how we're going to get a booth without becoming known again, without being useful again. Well, I, I don't know if there's an opportunity to team up with some of these small, a company that makes small boards for four time have it run uh, an exciting uh, application that would show up not only their hardware, but software as well. Alternatively, approach somebody like Match and develop some product for Maker Faire. Yeah. You know, half the booth would be selling the product, the other half of the booth would be working side. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know where it's going to take. Maybe, yeah, you may be right. Okay, well, uh, in the view, uh, in the view, uh, I have a high I would think that I could call it. No. Did you specifically mention teaching? When you applied, it, was it Sam that applied this year? Yeah. And I, I don't know. We'll have to ask him whether he, well, he mentioned it. Well, that's something we can talk about in a couple of months when Sam's back. Yeah. But one of the things we you know, one of the things that occurred to me is that we had a product that the class application applied, uh, something that allows you to plug a temperature sensor into a PC and then do something, uh, some clever experiment like, okay, does a cup of coffee uh, stay warmer longer if you put the cream in now or if you put the cream in when you're about to drink it? And it's not intuitive yet. It's a, an experiment that you have to do. And you have to be able to measure temperatures to, you know, a tenth of a degree. They're not with absolute accuracy, but relatively speaking. And uh, it's a fun thing to learn in the classroom, you know, for six or seven or eight years. Well, what I was thinking about, uh, Tim sort of brought up, is maybe instead of having a booth, we could give a presentation, a half hour presentation, about four. And that may be an alternative. Yeah, that, so there's a lot, a lot of venues uh, for, for doing these kind of talks. And so that may be uh, something to consider. What? 
Yeah, where are you going? Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. talk. Yeah, they typically all get a lot of people, but there's a lot of venues. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, uh, there's a venue we wanted to go in, such an outdoor venue, and uh, you know, maybe they'll have other venues. So there's so a lot of stuff all over. Yeah. 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 Let's keep all that in mind for uh, next year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Talk or am I talking? Yeah. You want me to talk? Yeah. I will talk. Here. Microphone. Can you turn it off? I don't think it's working, but I'll turn it off. Yes. I think it's coming from my computer. I think my computer is very good. It's actually working out very good. I haven't done that in this one, but it's getting plenty of bugs. It's picking up good. Well. Depends on how the ones you get. I had some 1.8 volt LEDs for my smart board GA144 that were very bright. So it depends. This board is from Coin. Coin is a company making a credit card that can be multiple credit cards. I interviewed with them and I was intrigued by what they're trying to do. Multipass. Okay. Pick up, pick up anybody. Um, it, they're, and they're doing an open source hardware of what they're doing. And this is their homepage of that. 
I haven't figured out exactly how to deal with it all yet, but it is a Arduino Mini with the TIBL chip, BLE chip, on the bottom. BLE is Bluetooth Low Energy. Oh. And their target is two gears on one battery. I measured this thing on those three AAA batteries, and it's about a week. Because the radio is on constantly. I've got to get in control of the radio before I'll get a decent battery. But it's interesting. That's what I'm working with. It's a toy. It's nice. So that's any questions on it? I don't know. Um, it is a, it looks like a QFM. Um, it's TI's chip. The CC blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, you, you notice that on it there's three connectors. One is serial. One is the Arduino programming connector. And the third connector is next to the um, TI chip is the CC interface, CC debugger, that you need for programming that chip. So there are two independent CPUs. They talk somehow. I haven't figured that all out yet. But I'm just starting to get into it's The name Bluetooth LE is actually old. It's Bluetooth Smart. Now it's a Bluetooth 4.0 spec. Um, I gotta figure out what it all means. But that's one thing. The other thing that I've been playing with, and we are actually broadcasting, is the Beastie Grip. Is this thing? It holds a smartphone and allows it to be a camera mount. It's basically this thing. And you have a place to mount a real lens. And this is the fun part. Is how do you actually get a phone out or a lens out? But here's all the pieces. Made in the USA. Um, 3D printed. It's cute. Um, Here's one little model that they made of it. That can be. There's the lens. Um, I'm just one to bid on this lens that is a Zoom, and I had to learn a lot about lenses. I've been learning thin lenses. And what is a zoom lens? And Kevin's been, since I take, have taken over camera of these meetings, Kevin's been wanting zoom. And I've been trying to get that for how long now? A couple of years. Smartphones are interesting devices because they have autofocus. They do the focus automatically. Therefore, they don't have depth of field. They have no depth of field. Everything's in focus, pretty much. Pretty much. They, they focus, in fact, having worked on projects that have cameras in them, they have a little voice coil that's constantly focusing. They're, con they're constantly focusing with software. Is how they how a, a smartphone works. The true term that you want in that case, you don't want a lens like this to do the focusing for you. If you've got the camera doing focusing, you don't want the lens doing focusing. And almost all zoom lens 
zoom means that as you adjust zoom, it adjusts focus. That focus goes with zoom. That if you focus in on that sign back there and you zoom in on it, you retain focus. That is the definition of a zoom lens. The old zoom lens, like this, this is a old legacy, one of the early zoom lenses, are actually verifocal lenses. Verifocal means that you vary the focus as it zooms. That when you zoom, you also have to focus again. Now, a normal zoom lens does that with a computer. They're doing that automatically. That's why zoom lenses are so expensive. Is they, they are automated devices. This is an old one. This is not automated. And so I will get this soon. I just wanted to do this, this last week. Um, the interesting part on this is that that's the Yes, this connector down here. This is the connector that hooks up to the camera. There are a handful of ways you hook the lens to a camera, depending on the manufacturer. One of the most, one that has lasted the longest is the Nikon. And I'm hoping that this is a Nikon fish. Which was the no, no, no. A Nikon has a F mount, letter F mount. That is Nikon's. And a few other manufacturers have also used F mount. Um, and therefore, F mount to 37 millimeter takes these th these steps, and camera guys are worse than we are about answering questions like this. How do you connect a F mount to a 37 millimeter camera? You basically have to have this first. That is the F mount. That goes to 52 millimeter. Then it's the wrong sex of 52 millimeter. So you have to have an adapter. And then you go 52 to 37. So I still have to buy all three of those. If it is actually an F mount, I don't know precisely. It, as soon as I get it, I have to go up to this, the Palo Alto camera store and say, what is this? <laughs> all you need to say is, the camera store, there's only one. Correct. Correct. And I can't pronounce their name anyway. You well, you should have. OK. Oh. So that's what I'm doing next, is getting the, cap, the lens. When it arrives, I take it up to the camera store, see if they've got the three adapters. Otherwise, I'll run on the internet. And then I can mount a lens onto the beastie group. And then I'll have zoom. You're ready. With no depth of field. Again, I do not have depth of field because the smartphone is automatically focusing. 
and it's focusing on everything effectively. It is focusing everywhere, and it is infinite focus. There is no depth of field. Yes, there is. I, it, I'm uh, apparently going to have fun with Android. They claim that iPhone has a switch that turns off autofocus. I'm going to have to figure out how to do that on Android. If I want to do depth of field. Now, doing depth of field requires more than just turning off focus. The autofocus. It requires this little thing. What that depth field adapter is, is, and you can see it in here, this is a focusing screen. That it is just a semi transparent screen that the lens can focus on so that you have manual focus. And the camera or the smartphone can take a picture of it and not focus. You basically have to shut off the focusing of your camera and then focus on a fixed point and have the lens adjust what you are focusing on manually. And then you can take pictures. There. Then you can take pictures like that. That has something in the foreground and Unfocused in the background. I've seen that movie where they have an actor in the foreground and the background, so you see one focus another. Right. That's depth of field. That is what depth of field is. That's a whole nother adapter that you actually have to make. And they have instructions on how to make one of these. And I don't know if I'll ever go there because I don't, for this venue, I don't care. We don't need depth of field. But for a, a professional photographer, you do. Any questions? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so really, we're doing No. Yes. You have to not only know photography, which has f stops and exposures and zoom and telephoto and all these other things. The science of photography. Right. You also have to know lenses, which has been however many years they've been doing lenses. Probably close to 100 now. 500 years for lenses? Or, yes, going way back. Yes. And you have to know that history because the mounts and the adapters are all different. And now I have to match those. <laughs> The F mount is one of the few that has made the transition from no autofocus to autofocus. Most of them have changed mount. The mount has changed. Because now you have to have more connection. You have to get power to your lens. And you have to get control to your lens. And yeah. 
is mess. We talk about the Venetian logo. Oh, yes. And as I said, we are doing this. This is live right now through this camera. If you look at the YouTube, and those of you online otherwise, uh, hopefully the audio is working. I, for some reason, I don't think this mic is actually working. I apologize, internet folks. Hopefully that can be great. Um, you'll notice that there's a, a circle around your image right now. If those who can see my computer, there's a circle around this image. On YouTube. That's looking through the 37 millimeter hole that's in the BC grip. This is going through my smartphone right now. My smartphone and my computer are running a program called Minicam. Minicam on the phone is broadcasting the system over Wi-Fi probably to Minicam server and my computer is going to the server and they're they're connecting to each other both of them over Wi-Fi <laughs> and because I didn't pay anything there's a Minicam logo at the bottom of our YouTube video this time whether that stays there depends on whether I want to pay them money whether this is actually going to work it seems to be working pretty good. The only thing we noticed this morning, and it hasn't happened yet, after about two and a half hours this morning, my phone started saying that it was turning off the charger because the battery got too hot. That was new. <laughs> That was interesting, but it may happen. So I don't know how, how well this is going to work. This is the first time I've actually gotten the whole setup to actually function properly. And it's a mess. But it's working. We don't have the mics. I don't have the mics working really well yet. That's another day. But yes, there is a logo on our on our YouTube screen. Oh well. I could maybe. <laughs> maybe. I don't know if Minicam will let me do that because it's their software. How much does Minicam cost? I don't even look. I don't know that. If, that, if this works, what's, what's the deal with the ring? So it looks like you still use the setup or is it just display like this? The fix for it is that I zoom in on my phone with software zoom and lose some resolution. Now that's an acceptable solution if I've got zoom on the lens. Now, that may be the way to go. And then only on maximum zoom out do I get the right. And in fact, only if I zoom out the camera to maximum resolution do I get the right. Brown doesn't have to do that. I haven't fixed that yet because it's interesting that it gets the reason to have the serpent at the moment. But, I don't know. This is the first time I've gotten the setup to work. I was just happy to do that this morning. Any other questions? Why 
You let speed. So, grab a boat, go to the bathroom, whatever. Mm. Okay. Um, no, but if you hook up something that's looking for the loose of you will see that. It's a lot. How would it what sort of thing is my phone do? It depends on the two dots. Do we use Bluetooth L it's four point oh um support. If you have the right software. Correct. It's whether you have our setup to talk to those gaps. G A T T. If you're ready to talk to those gaps, then yes. You can talk to it on my phone, I can see it. I haven't been able to talk to it yet. On an iPhone, supposedly you can see it and talk to it. Um, Windows only has HID gaps. Um, it depends on what support. And it is running Swift X. That's Swift X is done. Um, I was supposed to do microphone. Why?
And I'm not going so to fix the mic, because it will probably take rebooting the computer, which loops three. Okay. It so seems to be working. I, okay. If the mic is working, then there's nothing to fix. I am getting input from somewhere. I think it's, it's from here. That. I think it's from here. Really? Yeah. Right. I think this is picking up room. Perfectly fine. So then what happens? It's not as good as that mic. Okay. So let me ask you this. What do you think is wrong with I think I plugged too many of them in in first thing this morning. And it said, oh, you don't have any. It basically disabled this plug and anything other inputs. Okay. And what's the downside of taking would it take more than five minutes to reboot everything? It would take another stream. It's a big thing. It doesn't bother me so much. And I'm not sure that it's needed, though. That's what I don't. Without two of us here, I can't test quality. Yeah. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. I, I'm on board with whatever you want to do. And it sounds like. I think it's fine. Yeah, let's go with it then. Um, it, it's why I haven't dealt with it. It's picking me up very strongly. Yeah. Well, the great thing about being in charge of this is you don't have to convince me. It's, Good. You're, you, you got the steering wheel and you head it in the direction you want. I think it's fine. I will offer <laughs> and you are perfectly free to do that. I choose at this point to disagree that I'm not going to restart. It seems to be working. Roger that. Let's go with it. Even though Minicam.com is backwards. Well, that's just my computer. We know that one happens. Yeah. The other thing is that this is really important. So. so. I, that's just because I haven't put forth on there yet. No, that's John's fault. Oh, John's not stuff. Oh, right. So you're going to put a Bluetooth stack on a little port processor? No, no. I'm going to talk to the TI the Bluetooth stack on the TI chip from the Arduino with port. Okay. So you're saying that the chip takes all the hard out of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't have to put in a Bluetooth stack. Okay. When Dallas Corbett, the Supreme Being, showed up after checking the free trip, presents his card and says, What do you Oh, yes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I have one of those cards, sort of. <laughs> so I think the Europeans have a thing in their credit card. That I hope this is not just an RFID, but like the Marco Polo, the smart card. That if you, if you send your radio signal to it, it sends a, it doesn't send like your information, it sends information that validates. Uh, it's, that's the RFID, and not all smart cards have RFID, but many of them do. Um, it's one of the ways that you connect. To a smart card. Um, now, the coin isn't designed for smart cards. It's designed for the MagStripe cards, which is what we have. Because MasterCard and Visa have not wanted to replace all of their card readers, <laughs> which is a huge undertaking. That's a bit easier to go say, here, I'll give you a free year of credit. Correct. Correct. And that's what they're doing right now. When they made this decision 15 years ago, when I was working at Fourth Inc. and doing this for Europe A MasterCard Visa, we were doing a system in for it. We lost to Java Card. And 
MasterCard and Visa were only getting less than 1% fraud on credit cards, so they didn't care. They didn't want to switch from MagCard. Now, Euro, the Euro had to switch. They had to go to smart card because of all the countries in the Euro. They had no choice. Yeah. Yeah. Because they had too many countries. It means that they would have had to resolve all of the mag stripe systems across all of those countries. And it was easier to just say, here's a new standard that works across all of your countries, that works in the Eurozone. I worked on smart cards at four things. That's the mag stripe. Yes, and it's 20, 30 years old. So they had different ones. Yes, they had they had many in different countries. They're going to have to now because of the fraud. The fraud has gotten big. It has gotten big enough that it is costing them money. For the longest time, they just push it back on the merchant. <laughs> no, it was only one percent. They ate it. It was no, it was pennies. It was nothing. It was only a few million dollars. Correct. <laughs> and so they didn't work. Right now, it has gotten not only expensive but public. Now the problem. Correct. <laughs> and their own. Well, no, their only saving hope is to come out with a new system that they guarantee is secure. Yes, yes. It means that our credit cards will work in Europe, and they don't talk about that much yet. They will. It's almost... The, pro the problem there is the, the com competition between Europe, MasterCard, and Visa. We are MasterCard, Visa. Europe's not. Europe is Europe. And it's the com competition between those three arms. And they're very strong arms. <laughs> Oh, it's, go it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt them very big time to solve this problem. Square is wrong. And it's just out. This coin is wrong. And it's not even out. All of these things are, they're going to have to change. Um, they have for 15 years. We've had Java Card has been there for. Look up Java Card. They put it have a nice symbol on their website that says 15 years in business. Uh, there's the number. 15 years ago, I was working on with Ford. People still use Right. Yeah. Oh, there's going to be a cash in environment anyways. There'll probably be mag strike for a long time. They aren't going to kill it. They'll put the, set, the other reader in. The problem is that right now, the reader takes your card and then gives it back to you. 
that's not allowed with a smart card. You cannot take the user's card. You have to, he has to maintain a Z because it can have cash on it. It can actually have cash. And you no, know, you do not take the card away from them. Now with Magstripe, you want to take it away because you may take it away. You may not give it back. That reminds me of the whole series of scientific stories where instead of having a spark card, you had magnetic ink tattooed on the wrist. You put your arm in the recognizer, and if it was fraudulent, you just chop your arm off. Ah! Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a deterrent. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to do interplanetary banking, you have to have enforcement. Yes, you do. <laughs> and bear that in mind. Mm -hmm. As the enforcer, you're ready to go? Ready to go. Let's go. You're ready to go, then go, yes. How are you? Why are you? Why are you? My name is John Marble. I'm going to give you a talk. Wireshark, USB, C. Wireshark has been known as a network monitoring. You can look at Ethernet, wireless, whatever. But, uh, there is a feedback on the audio. Thank you. Do you have audio in the presentation? No. Just turn off the sound on the wall. Hey, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, the nice thing about it, especially if you were developing a USB device, uh, if you want to know what kind of traffic you have between your computer or your group up and your device in question. Uh, the problem we have now is that you just can't correct it going read with the interface.
<laughs> oh, these are that is vendor specific. It likes it fine. The box. The box. Are the unique thing? Thank you. 
Fourth drop.
A note, on Windows, life is a little bit more difficult. There is, the thing that does the capture on Windows is called WinPCAP. Yes. It's a separate program that's installed at the same time. But it will kill Windows 8.1. Really? Yeah. You have to reinstall Windows if you, if you install it. It is a very low, on Windows, you have to get a very low interface to USB stack down at the kernel level. And, yeah. Uh, and they may have fixed it by now. This was at the beginning of the year that I killed my computer. Oops. 
Yeah. It almost allows you to not need a hardware analyzer. Now, there are cases where the hardware analyzers help, namely when you have spec issues, because USB is an electrical interface. If your electrical interface is not quite right, Wireshark is not going to help, whereas these external tools will. And it depends on what you're looking at. There's been a bunch of times. There's, there's been a few of them. And I
your NERSOFT USB review is a wonderful tool. You, another note about Windows, especially USB. Every time you plug in a device to a Windows machine, it creates a registry entry. And that does not go away unless you explicitly delete it. The reason I, I ran into this in a manufacturing environment, you have to clear your register. Otherwise, you will kill your Windows computer. Yes. And so you have to do this. I, I don't understand why I stay away from that. Oh, you know what? So what? Yeah. <laughs> Which is why USB debut is so valuable. Is it does it clean it? It does it correctly. You can do it correctly and your registry is fine. But you have to do all the steps. And I I've played around with DB and had to do it. Yeah, this is a it's a software. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I'm it, the the USB device devices view is on their phone. It's their tool. USB D view is their tool. He, I'm really impressed with how good this guy is. And he seems to have a lot of support. He has probably a lot of languages. Yeah. Yeah. He, he is a very impressive guy. And I have you, it, as soon as I went there, you, oh, yeah. I love that tool. <laughs> The projector is wider than the screen. It's 
a little bit with USB. There's one control that is real cool, um, but not many pubs use it, that you might want to put on notes to look into. And that's called hub control, H-U-B-C-T-R-L. It turns off power oh, yes. from yeah. the host so that you don't have to unplug the plug and plug it back in. It will turn off the power at the host level to the hub so the device thinks it's unplugged. No, it's not OS specific. Yes, hub control, the application, is Linux. Um, it is hub specific. In fact, hub controller chip specific. Right. There are only a few hubs that do this. <laughs> Correct. No, you're sending a command from the host to the hub saying, turn your power off on this port. Oh, it's it's a wonderful tool. Um, it was you. It's used more on power strips um, for dealing with power strips, and you turn the power off, and it's wonderful. Yes.
<laughs> yes. Or, well, in those cases, they do have power strips that are US, that are internet controlled. That you can go turn off the power on the power strip. Yeah, you can. I've seen them for many. They fix the problem. Yes, yes. Um, same, same situation on the on the hub control, and they stopped making these hubs. They don't have the the, the hub. It was not popular enough of a feature. I have done nothing with yet, but uh, probably should have mentioned it. 
because remember with all these you all know, have the uh, things that the uh I think I know not forbidden the phone has an interface uh to get the uh talk to US devices from from Congress browser. Um and one of these days I I can actually try to do something. I, I gather it is reasonably concerned. I actually uh, I actually have a request for the folks to put them and uh it, it, it seems to be very particular like you have to be you know, Player who you have to do it for its own extension and you have to say, you know, here is the device that I talk to and it's a game that I can write. The perspective is, uh, for instance, not likely to be possible to uh, just sniff for everything. You know, things of that nature. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, just to mention that, you know, if you want to be talking to you, you have to do it for your own reason. The frightening thought that somebody who's done all of these interfaces is going to interact with God's thing. Anyhow, that's, that's that. Um, so I thought we could just quickly take a look at it and put it in some ideas. Yeah. 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 Apparently, uh, I looked at four four of the graphs that was kind of in the image of some hand. There is some potential to jump into the remote. Um, and, uh, and got me. 
and uh, and uh, the, the, the things that we don't have in the palliates is we have uh, we have uh, the very true form of subprimes. They do not form because we have to modify this program to use our spawn and we're still working for the job. Um, and you can wait to it and you have to look at the other one. We've also got, uh, the, uh, the way we don't have this type of genetic backup is not as limited as we think, but it's obviously it's a Um, and, uh, so anyway, we have to say, so this, uh, I'll already throw it down in this perspective of the clone genetic yet, although we don't have the clone yet, because, uh, it spawns a supplement Uh, which is 
um, the, uh, and, uh, and big lot here is obviously the position of um, but, um, and I'm looking forward to adding more things to this environment, and, uh, and, uh, I really hope to see it in the world. Um, thank you. 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 Check out the uh, search for building an app last week. It covers similar content to this. We also talk about the debugger over there. So, a little bit simpler with the debugger over there. Maybe we work on that. Yeah, so we have to do that. Yeah, so
what I used to do. I could also capture this video and then put another spot. But mostly what I wanted to do is start some things that was run to the speed of the speakers and the soundboard. Instead, I could go both to the soundboard and run. Uh, uh, But I'm kind of unhappy with the new Slayer's version that I actually came for because it goes and apparently calls up the license server now that I paid for it. Wants to check, I guess, every time I start it up, whether I'm actually running the license properly. So I don't go through it. So it's, it's just a free play media connector that we put a so, if, well, I guess my point here is that I object to software that goes out and asks each time you start it whether it's, it's okay or it's paying for it. Now, I sort of was unhappy with Windows product after this, but product after this. I want to copy of Office. That office on, copy of office that I prefer is one that doesn't do product packaging. You know, my wife wants one that does everything for the world. So the technician wanted to show you, I haven't closed the window already. There are numerous and sundry examples of Ethernet power switches. And uh, the thing that we talked about, about just sitting down at a terminal and looking, rebooting from a server or something, is sort of the most basic function that you and I do. I couldn't find an example that doesn't do a couple of other tricks. The first most obvious next step after you have a power switch is a TCP IP stack is, is the clean server taken. And if it doesn't respond to you, say, well, all right, do that way, and we boot your app, you know, with the new power cycle, whatever server it is on the other end of this. I had the expectation that it was a such and such an app. Happen in all cases, but it would probably require at least a food responder and maybe something a little clever on the part of the server. Yes, if it wants to change, you've got to hope that it's doing all the other things it's supposed to do as well. But it would go into the server and say, okay, I'm going to check all those things internally that I'm supposed to do. If I don't do one of them, I'll turn off the thing. And then the, the power switch will be beaten. The other thing it has that you can most of the use is a little clock. The thing that says, oh, you can set up a schedule to that. So you can tell it, okay, every night at midnight, it's like when the reader clock is, I have to, you know, this is still good. I have to reboot every once in a while, or I'll eventually crash. Eventually, so you know, whatever. But it doesn't run forever. It's being used to the window. So if you're dying at 2 o'clock in the morning, you schedule it.
I, I may be overloading the web, the, the Wi-Fi. It's trying to show me a local copy. That's the USB. Yeah, I'm pretty close to You are? Okay. So I'm not overloading. Yeah. That's crazy. I don't know how to turn that stuff off. Yeah, that's what I wondered why OSHA would be involved, but if you've well, got powdered metal. metal powder Correct. Okay. And it's really hard to get out. In fact, plus these are very specific associated with yeah. the thermite. And then there's stuff that will put out burning metal. Yes. And um, good walk. Right. <laughs> And that will wake up Ocho real quick. So that is what that is about. Anybody more stuff. said powdered method. Oh, yeah. I know an interesting project that was sort of interesting. That would be kind of a cool thing to show as maker technology. Uh, yep. Either as an application for your desktop computer, you can sit for it, or maybe buy a microphone, or maybe a microphone for your laptop. The problem with the maker share and uh, demo is it's easy to think of in a twenty two fifty in a form. So that means it's like lights, flashing lights. Okay. It's got blinking lights, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, 
remember who Roomba is. They sell to the government. Therefore, things have to be expensive. I can sell you a regular Roomba class, is iRobot. iRobot is government. It sells directly to DOD. 
So basically, they don't back to the question. No, no. <laughs> they have much more sophisticated robots than the I than the Roomba. It could. It could. It's not. It's not. Oh yeah. 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 It, it's a toy robot. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're actually doing a very nice consumer side along with the DOD side. And they just don't talk about the DOD side. So, Bits are the best invention ever made. What is carrot So are we done? Yeah. They have noticed that everybody but us has left. Right. I have noticed that, that people started leaving a while the, ago. It was the individual adjournment. But uh, I think John's just in the bathroom. Everybody got bored. I always had a lot of respect for Brad and told us because he decided it was time to leave him. He was right. When, when it gets boring. Uh, I'm going to down the here. Let's go 
Um, stop broadcasting first.